I will now introduce um, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Kailash Satyarthi, who was stuck in traffic in London. <laughs> Kailash is a very remarkable man. He has dedicated 30 years of his life to rescue children from slavery, 84 southern of them. And he has always used the rule of law, bringing many cases to the Indian Supreme Court, prompting some very important rulings that in turn helped him pursue his noble mission. In 1980, Kailash gave up his career as an engineer to initiate a movement to end child labor and exploitation. It was a very good, difficult fight in a country, India, which was in total denial of the issue. Doesn't exist. So Kailash has been accused of being a spy. He has been wounded several times. Two of his colleagues died at the hands of the traffickers. And in 1998, Kailash launched the global march against child slavery, against child labor and slavery. This is an umbrella organization which today groups together more than 2,000 NGOs and trade unions across 140 countries. A great admirer of Mahatma Gandhi, Kailash has led dozens of peaceful protests against child labor while promoting the cause of universal education, which has resulted in the right of children to free and compulsory education act ratified by the Indian parliament in 2009. This past May, Kailash organization led one of the largest joint rescue operations in India between anti-trafficking tra campaigners, railway police, and child rights groups. As a result, 63 children were rescued and 23 traffickers were arrested. Well done. In April this year, when I met him in Delhi, he told me a story that I will never forget. It's the story of two little boys that he had rescued. They were refusing to bond with the other children in his shelter. So they were sitting on the side, looking suspicious. It was only days later when another child got them to utter a few words that they, they asked him, why are these people so kind with us? They want our eyes or our kidneys? They could not imagine one second that someone would want to be kind with them and look after them without wanting to abuse them even more. That story top my, touched my heart. It gives a real idea of the hell these children grow through and how difficult it is to rebuild trust after, which Kelas organization does. It is with immense joy that I ask you to come on the stage, Kelas. Dear Monique, I was already humbled and you made me more by introducing me in such a way. Now you can see two people in a typical South Asian, South Asian jacket and a typical kurta, one after the other. And by the way, both of them are Nobel laureates today. <laughs> I was listening carefully, uh, you know, why. Thank you. Uh, I am overwhelmed with congratulations and support, interest, from all over the world in my work. 
And right from the day one when the Nobel announcement was made, I said that this is the biggest ever recognition to the faces of children who remain faceless for centuries. This is the biggest ever recognition to the voices of children who remain voiceless for centuries. But also, this is the biggest ever honor for entire anti-slavery community. It's the biggest honor for all anti-child labor activists and all education campaigners across the world. And you are here, so I'm very happy to see you here. Thank you so much. I was, I was just greeting and shaking hands with many of the who's who in this field. Thank you for bringing all the great minds together. But when I'm looking uh, in the audience, I think most of you are very young people. <laughs> and that's even more important for me. Yesterday I was uh, in Netherlands with the, the ceremony of Children's Peace Prize. It was also the 10th anniversary. And these boys and girls entered into the hall. The king was there, all the dignitaries were there. And I was uh, opening this with Archbishop Dusman Tutu. So I said that one young people brings a powerhouse with her. And that is good enough to illuminate this hall or the city. But if so many young people come together to fight for child rights and today to fight slavery, then the world is going to be free of child slavery, child labor, and free of miseries with millions of my sisters and brothers and young children are facing. I could see this in you. Sometimes it's really painful to talk of human slavery in 2014. Today, on 19th of November, 2014, we are still talking of it. Despite all the advancement made in technology, market, economies, businesses, governance, politics, religions, cultures, civilizations, what not? Despite all the big brains who are sitting here, Despite much more money, funds available than ever before, much more knowledge, much more experience. But in this stage of history, we have the largest number of slaves in the world. We have the biggest amount of illicit earning out of human trade. I always say that denial of childhood and denial of freedom are the biggest sins which the humankind has been committing and perpetuating for ages. It is unacceptable. It's unacceptable. I recall another story. You have provoked me to talk of some children, Moni. A question raised by a girl whom I freed when she was six years old from an intergenerational uh, slavery. Her grandparents were trafficked to work in a stone mining, stone quarries. Her parents were born and grew up there, and uh, she was born there. When I was bringing in uh, my car, all those groups, uh, all these children, including herself. 
Besides other things, when I was trying to make them a little bit comfortable, uh, she asked, why didn't you come early? When she gained confidence in me, these two, two, two boys gained confidence after a while, but this girl got it. That's why girls are most beautiful. They are most powerful. They are the biggest source of power and confidence and trust. And she asked, why didn't you come early? And I, I realized that this was not the question to me. This was the question to everyone who believe in humanity, human rights, freedom, liberty, dignity of human being. Why don't we act now? The same girl, once we were having a conference in Delhi, and it was attended by the heads of two UN agencies, UNICEF and UNESCO, the global heads. Kerel Belami was there, Mr. Matsura was there, and some of the top officials from ILO were also there. And this girl was introducing herself, and after that I introduced the dignitaries. He is the head of education in the world, he is the, she is the head of children and women related issues. And the girl was fast enough. She picked up the microphone in front of everyone. And she asked, if so many big people are present here, and if they all can come together, what stops to end child slavery? What stops to bring every single child into school? What stops? And I tell you, dear sisters and brothers, my young friends, nobody has any answer. What stops us? And today I'm asking this question, bringing all these questions raised by this young lady. Why didn't we go early? What stops us when all of us are together here? And the third time, she tried to answer her own question. She was invited uh, for an important event at United Nations. We organized what we called Class of 2015. Uh, that time, Gordon Brown was the Prime Minister of this country and Australian Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, and many more dignitaries. Queen Rania was there. And the girl, her name is Devli. Devli was speaking to, to the people. And she tried to answer her own question. She said that, I have never seen such big people, such rich people, such great people. But I can tell that when I was freed, I decided that in my community, every child will go to school and no girl will go to domestic help and would be trafficked from this area. No, no agent can come and take any girl or boy from my community. Everyone would be in school. She worked hard and within a year, 36 boys and girls were enrolled in school initiated with her effort in her community. And she answered question, but again asked that if I can do as a small young child, 11 year old, to that time she was, why can't you do? Why can't you do all the big people in the world? Friends, I'm not going to talk on the problems. I'm a believer of solutions. And I always believe that the solution of the problem lies in the womb of the problem itself. The solutions cannot be prescribed. The knowledge, expertise, funds, everything is needed. Everything is needed. They are very important, inevitable. But one has to find solution where the problem exists. And that needs action. I don't know how much time I have. I could not see it because, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's already done. 
<laughs> God. God. This is the problem with the act activists. This is, if I'm an academician, I could have done it according to time, so, but I'm going to, I'm going to sum up. So, the answers lie in certain things, in my, not opinion, I am not an opinion person. As I said, I, am, I fight on the ground for so many years. And therefore, my leg is broken, my head is broken, I have my backbone broken, my arm is broken. So with all these broken parts of my body, I try to bring some answers. One is, we have to build new culture of partnerships and alliances. The conventional wisdom, the conventional thought about or approach about building partnership has to be revised. More genuine partnership, more equal partnership, and the partnership among and between various stakeholders. We, we have to rise above the suspicions and criticisms the partnerships between civil society and businesses, partnership between NGOs and governments, and governments and civil society, and civil society and governments and businesses, teachers, activists, trade unionists, religious organizations, institutions and individuals of faith must come together and find collective solutions. The second answer lies in enforcement of laws. We have to have strong laws, stringent laws in our countries because we are fighting against a crime. So if we are fighting against a crime, we have to make the optimal use of the laws as weapons and tools in our hands. Sometimes good laws are there, but they remain dormant. We have to make use of laws. Thirdly, we have to build a sense of urgency. Think for a while that if my own child is missing for a day, if my own child is trafficked and sold, what would you do? You become restless. You will do everything possible. You are not going to organize a conference. You are not going to sit on a table and discuss of the, of the problem of trafficking. You are not going to, to make a plan. You are not going to write a project proposal and submit to a funder to give money to us because my child is gone. I never did it. Whenever I come to know that a child is missing, a child is enslaved, I act immediately. Whether I have money or not, whether I have man or not, whether I have any resource or not, I cannot wait. That has been my experience. Don't wait. Act if your own child is missing. Sense of urgency. And the final thing is we have to build strong moral solutions to the problem. Yunus Bhai was talking about the mix of moral and business solutions. The business model in moral, with moral soul, I would say, or social soul. We have to look for being, we have to look for becoming honest to our children, to honest to the people whom we are talking about and working for. We talk of slavery, we talk of trafficked women and trafficked girls, but how we act. I'm talking of action, but that is also a moral question that we have to, we have to dig out the tremendous potential inside us and translate into collective action and build a worldwide movement, strengthen a worldwide movement, like a civil rights movement against slavery. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for my time. <laughs>